Two people have entered the waiting room. See waiting room. Um, okay, can anyone hear me? I hear a ding, 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 ding. Um, participants. Wow, that's a really close cool up. Um, hmm. I have absolutely no idea how to even get on. I mean, I see that I'm on, but I don't know how to open it. Have I don't know. So, um, how did you get there? I went to a link that she sent, okay. and then I. They gave me, oh, I had to go to Keller 521. Oh, no, I had to go to, like, Zoom.com and enter in our password. Todd, have you done Zoom? Any Zoom classes? How do I get, so people are there, but how do I get to them? Like, it's just me. How do I? You're recording, Mark. Thank you. are doing your own Zoom right now. Or, and Um, seven people, so they're just mm -hmm. waiting. So just you know, see them waiting. Yep, and, and I just, and I did that. I think you just gotta wait now for it to start. I don't have to hit start. No. Um, see, and I keep getting these dings, and I don't know what that means. Can they <clears throat> see seven people are? Oh, admit all. Oh, here we go. <laughs> hey, everybody. Oh, somebody is in Florida or Hawaii. Chris Robinson. Robson. Okay, let's see who else is coming here. Can you all hear me? Yes. Um, I'm Nick. I just haven't put my first name in there. Okay, well, this is my first time doing a Zoom meeting, and I can see myself in the corner. I can see Chris and Jenny. Oh, Melanie here. Oh, yep, yeah. I'm here. Does anyone uh, in the room? Okay, now I have a full face of you. I see Tammy is here, Tyler, Fitz. Okay, um, I'm going to hit recording. And I'm just going to go with it here. And uh, if anyone has any questions, I think somehow there's a way I may get a message. My name is Michelle Babcock, and this is my first time um, doing a Zoom class. And today we're going to talk about 
um, selling your listing. But before we do, I want to kind of get an idea of, if you want to um, introduce yourself, like how long you've been in real estate and where your market center is. In real estate for about three and a half months. I'm in Rochester, Minnesota. Okay. And your first name was Nick? Yes. Okay. Um, Tammy? Welcome back, Tammy. Can you hear me? Uh, yeah, I think I'm unmuted here. <laughs> oh, I can hear you now. Okay, I don't see your face, but that's okay. So, Tammy, welcome back to Keller Williams. Oh, and, thank you. Um, so, you left and you came back, and your market center? Um, well, I'm with the John Buckingham team right now. Oh, you are. Okay, got it. So wherever so, John works, he's a. Uh, oh, he's a here, and he's in the office at in the Rochester. Right. Where are you? I am at home right now. In Rochester. <laughs> yeah, I'm in Rochester. Yeah. Okay, got it. Um, Buckingham, I call him all the time with questions. He's like, especially if you have ever have any questions on well and septics, call John Buckingham. He is he knows everything so that's just kind of a tip here um as you get listings and if they have well and septic that's a whole another thing to learn but uh john's a good resource um tyler hi yeah so i've been with keller williams for about two months and i got my first listing uh, at the end of last month and that's kind of where i'm at right now okay good then we can use that to as a reference here um let me see here chris yes um i've been in real estate a, <laughs> just a little over a month about five weeks now um out of rochester very good um i know that there's more you know pardon me while i learn how everything jenny Hi, I've been in real estate for just over a year, and I'm out of Winona. Have we met? Yes, we did meet um, okay. right, right, right away when I started. Yep, okay, I remember you. Um, and Nick, we talked to, I, um, oh, here we go, Melanie. Uh, yep, I've been in real estate for about four months now um, in Rochester. Um, have my first closing next Tuesday. For buyer or seller? Buyer. Got it. Okay. Congratulations. Thanks. And let me see here. Tyler, I think we talked to Jenny. Um, Chris. Do we have two Tylers? No, um, then, oh. do I, is there somebody I missed? Cindy, are you on yet? I know that you'll be checking in and out. Okay, well, just that kind of gives me an idea and um, Tyler has is working on his first listing. You said a month, that'll be a good um, resource for us. Um, so we, I, I have the curriculum in front of us. I've been in real estate for 15 years. Um, I, my history is I started with Edina Realty and as I married a realtor 15 years ago, I went and got my license. He thought he was getting a secretary that didn't really, what wasn't my plan. And um, we spent, I got my license in 2005. And in 2005, real estate was, phenomenal uh, everything sold lenders were even told to whoever comes in give them a loan um, sellers were selling buyers were buying interest rates if I remember right were probably six and seven percent and um, then the economy crashed and by 2008 we were going down 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 in the course of listing properties um, you have your your curriculum and you know Basically, this is kind of boilerplate stuff. And the selling a home changes 
depending upon the kind of market that we have. So we'll dive into that more as we go through your listing material here. And so you guys are all on your sixth session. You've had six different instructors. And um, I imagine learning a lot of things that come from this course. The best way to learn, honestly, the best way to learn is to get the business, to, um, to get the listing, because that's how you learn. And one of my favorite sayings, um, when I came to Keller Williams, I've been here eight years, I believe. Um, one of the first things I learned in real estate was you have to list to exist. So that's a comment we'll come back to. Um, if you will just shout out to me, when you think of real estate, it doesn't have to be Keller Williams, just when you think of real estate, who do you think of? Give me some names. Anybody? Everybody. Edina. Who, Jenny? You're muted. Edina. Um, nope, I want an agent name. Tell me an agent that stands out. Angela Thompson. Robin Gwaltney. Yeah, like Taylor Mickelson or Danielle Sparks. Danielle, yep. Yeah. Sean Barishka. Chris Lindahl out of the cities. Oh, yeah. Just because his gang billboards. Okay. Yep. That's right. All over the place. He literally has every single exit coming in and out of Rochester. Like, fun back billboards. Um, your success in real estate is contingent only upon yourself. And so these interrupters that you see, like Chris Lindahl, um, Robin Gwaltney, um, Danielle Sparks, everybody has a way that they do business. And I guarantee you their success in real estate is not contingent upon you. So understand that your success in real estate is not contingent upon them either. Um, you have to list to exist. These people, I'm not sure who Angie is, but like Robin, Danelle, Sean, Chris Lindahl, what, can anyone tell me what's the one thing they all have in common? They're, you see their name all the time. Why do you see their name? Well, I don't think Chris is actually selling houses, but he's a lot of advertisement, but I see a lot of signs of Robin Gwaltney and Daniel Sparks and Lori Mickelson. Like they have a lot of uh, listing signs up in people's properties. Why, correct. So I'll keep going with that. There are listing signs on people's properties. So what's the one thing that all these people have in common? They're <laughs> listing, <laughs> they're <laughs> listing agents. You have to list to exist. So remember that. That is not from Ignite, that's just a fact. You need listings. You can be a buyer's agent, but all these people that you rattled off, they're all listing agents. That's why you see their signs. And that's what marketing is all about. So we're gonna talk about selling your listing, marketing. Um, by being a listing agent, um, that will bring buyers and hopefully, you know, um, it'll, well, well, we'll come to that here, but you have to list to exist. And if you look at anybody, you know, Sean Barishka, Robin Gwaltney, they have these teams. They're the rainmaker. They're the number one listing agent and everybody else is, you know, part of a team and they all have their role. Um, my success in real estate is not contingent upon Robin's. Um, or, you know, Chris's or Sean's or anybody. It's really about, I have to look at what my business plan is. And for me, I'm an individual agent. I'm not, I don't want a team. And so I wanna give like phenomenal real estate experience. I wanna make sure that I take exceptional care of my clients. The goal is not to get, um, my personal goal is to have three to four clients that I'm working with at one time. That way I can do the business and provide that ph phenomenal service. If I get bigger than that, um, then I may have to change my business model. But I think I, I really want everybody to understand that your success in real estate is contingent only upon yourself. And I believe, um, I left 27 years in education five years ago. I've been in real estate for 15 years and I came to Keller Williams about eight years ago. And when my husband got sick and could no longer work, it was just me. And I, 
I left the district to focus on real estate because I was at Keller Williams and Keller Williams has the most amazing education. And so there are things that you will hear. We kind of have our own language, our own little one-liners. And I encourage you to take bold, to take, I mean, anything that you can, because you're going to, everything is going to teach you. And sometimes you need to hear things once, sometimes three times, sometimes 20 times before you have that aha moment. And by going to the business classes that Keller Williams offers, um, allows you that opportunity. So um, we are going to, everything is, is scripted. Um, today, I think we start off, you all have to tell me your numbers. How are you doing with that? So Nick, how about you? Let's start with you. Uh, pretty good, my numbers are, it's looking good. Um, I just got my first listing uh presentation on saturday so i'm pretty excited about that i'm working with two buyers right now so i'm getting some traction by making these calls and updating command so i can follow up easier and be more organized so um organization you're either an organized person or you're not and you have to take a look at right keeping your database is really important um, they say if you feed your database and work your database, um, that, that will provide you with a lifetime of business. Um, and your first listing, and you already have a couple of potential buyers for it? Um, maybe not for that one, but I'm working with some buyers in some other areas. So there, yeah, okay. yeah, it's so like three different people, but if I can bring a seller and a buyer together, I'm all for it. So, yep. Um, dual agency. It, it, comes involved and that's a whole nother ball game. But when you list a house, um, when I list a house, my job is to sell that house and to put it out there for all of the agents to see that have buyers that have the money to buy this property. And um, so different areas of, of um, different communities do real estate differently. You know, some of the smaller communities have more dual agency than the larger eight cities do, like Rochester. But um, dual agency is kind of a slippery slope. And if you list a house with the sole intent of selling it yourself, then you're not looking out for your client's best interest. So I just want to make sure um, that that's understood. It can be done. You want to make a win-win. But when you're listing a house and with that expectation in mind, I mean, you're working for your seller. What's in the best interest of your seller? And that is to market the property out there for everybody to see. And whoever has the best everything, you know, terms, motivation, um, down payments, will make the outcome. Um, yeah. yeah, it doesn't matter if I sell it or not, for sure. As long as it's right. getting sold, I am all for it. Yeah. And you have to list to exist. And so when, when I think about my job um, for my listings, it's like how, you know. So anyway, thank you for sharing. Tammy, how, how are you coming with your numbers? Um, I've got uh, a couple of... Uh... A couple of leads. Um, I'm working with uh, a buyer right now, and I just keep calling the people that I've done open houses for. Um, even when I was at Edina, I still have my sheets, and I just keep calling those people. You know, I ask them if I call them every so often, just to kind of check and see how they're doing. You know, I know some of them are just uh, starting to look, so I've been calling those people and and just trying to call friends and stuff and let them know that I'm in real estate. Excellent. Um, a couple things that I want to highlight on that I really like what you said. Um, one of the things, what, when you go into an open house, um, why do you do open houses? Anybody can answer. Why do you do open houses? Is it a to get exposure? Hmm. Nope, I haven't heard the right answer yet to find buyers. There you go, there you go. You do open houses to find buyers. Um, do houses sell during open houses? 
Sure, once in a while. I think I, I remember in my 15 years, um, the one that stands out is over Southeast that I did an open house and um, a buyer came through. They were working with another agent, but that open house sold it and they went to their agent and we brought a deal together. But make no mistake about it, you have open houses to pick up buyers. Um, I look at, and that's great. Um, and during that open house is a prime opportunity for you to sell yourself. Um, I want you all, and I can, I can't see all your faces, but I want you all just to kind of look into the screen and smile. There. Now you can hold that smile. Or, and, I, and I'm gonna ask you to smile again, but I want you to kind of just dig down deep when you smile and feel that, that um, surge of energy that just kind of comes from your heart out. Um, a smile is so contagious. And in these times, um, people are scared. And if you come at them with a smile and it's a true genuine smile and you're open, you're just gonna have better success at this. Um, so let me see here. The other thing, so the open houses, those sheets that you had them check in, I save every open house sheet that I have. I have them from 10 years ago. And they're always a good source to go back through. Um, throughout your real estate career, you're gonna have up and downs. You're gonna have times where you spend a lot of time lead generating, and then all of a sudden you're busy working the business and you forget to lead gen. You're not supposed to, but that's what happens. And then um, you get some business and you're back at it again. But keeping those open house sign-in sheets and following up, whether it's six months or two years later, um, great, great, Tammy. Thank you for, for stating that. Um, the other thing that you stated, let me see here. No, I don't recall. If I, come, if I remember it, I'll come back. But thank you, Tammy. Um, Tyler, you said you had your first listing. How are you doing with your numbers and your calls? Yeah, so end of last month, I got my first listing. It's um, a vacant lot that my parents actually own. And so they were excited that I got my realtor license so they could list that with me. Um, but it being a vacant lot, it has its own uh, challenges. And then uh, I've actually got a, uh, a buyer that I'm working with um, that is actually moving from Wisconsin to Minnesota. So I'm Very gonna, good. I'm working with them and they'll be up on Tuesday to look at some houses. Okay. Let's see here. Um, Chris. Yes, things are going uh, very well so far actually. Um, I spend at, at least two days a week uh, with my team leader from the Q Realty Group. We do at least an hour, usually two or three, um, just doing lead gen back and forth uh, calls. So I'm doing very well on the calls um, and getting some appointments set. I have uh, one buyer that is, uh, has an accepted offer. So we're just waiting for closing at the end of November. Um, I have a listing that just went live yesterday and another buyer that I think we're going to be putting in an offer today on possibly. So. Good job. Wow. So two months and you're, you're, you just keep moving forward. Um, I, I, I love what you said. You, you're, you're calling and you're getting things going back. The other thing that Tammy had said is, you know, those open house sheets, but business doesn't seldom does business happen instantly. Business happens three months, six months, two years, five years down the road. So some of the people that you're meeting now, just going by my own experience, you keep that, just kind of that touch with them, with that personal touch, and eventually that lead is going to turn into to business. And so, um, very good, very good. Um, Chris. Yeah, that was just me. Oh, got it, okay. Uh, Jenny, Jenny. Um, sure, things are going well. I actually am going to be working, I will probably have to jump off at some point because I, 
found a for sale by owner and for a client and it was really quite fun because I got both the I brought the client there and I had the owner there and I said, let's talk this and let's figure out a price before I walk out the door. And I don't know if that's the right, wrong or otherwise, but it sure worked. I saw. Um, <laughs> um, that's another discussion and I yeah. really encourage you maybe um, to learn from it. Um, one thing that when, when you go get your real estate license and, and the one thing that's, and the reason that you take continuing ed um, the one thing that just kind of makes me a little concerned about that, Jenny, is, you know, I think about liability and dual agency and, um, we had a price going in, uh, they, prior to going that day, um, we had a, a price. So it was how to figure out the closing, the, um, just a few technical things. So it really wasn't that we were agreeing on a final price. It was how everything was going to be played out. So, right. And so you were a, acting in a dual agent role? Where no. He was clearly on his own. It was a for sale by- uh, So you are representing the buyer. So you're representing yes. your buyer's best interest. Yes. Um, and, um, okay. Sometimes that's hard to do with the seller right there. So I would just caution you. Um, it was that we had a price. So it was. Um, nothing she about the price. Nothing about the price. Having any discussion um, with when you're representing the buyer with the seller right there um, okay. is right. It, it doesn't really, you aren't able to consult or advise your client. Think of yourself. So as a real estate agent, I don't know if any of you or how many of you have ever worked with an attorney. If you ever have an opportunity to assist somebody and just to um, listen to an attorney, I, I like to, um, you're almost like an attorney. And if you can't, well, that's the big discussion and we're here to focus today about listing, but I would just really, really caution you to be careful. That's just my opinion. Um, you can talk with the broker on that or, you know, but that's just, just my thought. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, Melanie. Yeah. Um, things are going pretty good. I do a lot of contacting, um, through Facebook. Um, I just took a bunch of note cards around my neighborhood to kind of get to know a bunch of the neighbors, uh, in my cul-de-sac and introduce myself. Um, so yeah, I mean, things are going good. I'm focusing a lot on trying to get out and see a lot of properties. Um, which I think has been really helpful because it's <laughs> it's amazing the different things that are out there um, and the different ways that different companies will let people present their homes for sale, I guess. It's not companies. You are an independent agent. So you work, you have your license, you know. When you're going through agency, you know, you are a, you know, if it's a seller's agent or a buyer's agent, um, and then we hang our license, you know, it's a Keller Williams listing and I'm an agent thereof. And how I present my listing is going to be totally different, you know, than you present yours. Or I mean, everybody, we do want to have uniformity and we'll talk about some of those things that are no-nos, but I, I love that you're going out and reviewing properties, especially when you see properties online in the photographs and then when you go look at them in person. Um, it's a different feeling. And so um, I like that. The neighborhood canvassing. Um, a personal, um, just my thought is, it's really hard to get your neighbors to think of you seriously. Um, so my philosophy, like when I lived in Rochester, I live in Wabasha now, but when I lived in Rochester was I kind of stayed out of my immediate neighborhood, um, but I would focus two or three or four blocks out. Um, um, or I would find another neighborhood for depending on what I was looking for. But I, that door knocking and working a neighborhood is really a good idea when you, however you do it, whether you go door knocking, you know, try to keep like a little journal or a, a notepad of the people that were extra friendly or um, the people that you just feel like didn't 
seldom do people shut the door in your face, but people that you feel like, you know, they were nice. And those are the people that you want to send that thank you card to that you've been writing. Um, for me, that handwritten note has probably been my number one revenue generating. People love a handwritten note. Um, maybe that's generational, okay? My clientele over time does seem to be more so um, probably, I'm 59 years young, so you know maybe more of the, the boomer age and older, but everybody likes getting mail. Well, except for the negative stuff. So a handwritten note, to me, that's like the number one thing that you could do. Um, and Facebook. Um, Facebook is forever changing. The way that I marketed two months ago using Facebook is totally different today. And I'm finding myself like, okay, now how do I do this? I need to do a Facebook um, in command. I need to do that again. And, um, but so staying on top of things, it, it is forever changing. Um, Angie. Um, oh, sorry. Nope, those are my notes. Uh, did I miss somebody? Okay. <clears throat> so we've gone through your numbers. And I believe that I'm, I am recording this. And now we're supposed to cut you loose for 20 minutes and kind of let you do some lead gen, make your phone calls. In Keller Williams classes, the curriculum that you take, everything is very focused. You know, you do this for this number of minutes and this for this number. And um, I get the feeling, I don't know, let me, what are your thoughts? Should we stop for 20 minutes or do you want to continue and you can do those phone calls on your own? I'd like I wouldn't to mind continue. continuing. Okay, good, that's done, okay. Then the next thing that we're supposed to do, and we'll come back and we talk briefly about it, are those handwritten notes. So it's like they want you to take five minutes and write three notes. Um, I look at that and think, well, it takes me 10 minutes to write one note. So um, I think this is another thing that we'll, we'll move by. If you haven't written notes, I encourage you to find a couple, you know, one a day or or two a week or you know five a month or whatever you can do put it into your time blocking uh, truly it probably takes 10 minutes to write a note um, depending upon and what I do with my notes is I always have a purpose when I do my notes so if, whether it's following up from door knocking or if I'm going after expired listings or if I'm going after FISBOs or whatever it is that I send that handwritten note um, I kind of write my note and, and if I like it, then I make a copy of it and then I kind of go from there and then I find myself the second note. I maybe change it up a little bit, but I still have my original script. Um, and do what works best. Um, those handwritten notes, they're a personal touch. Sorry to interrupt, but uh, yes. could, you, could you let Lisa in the, from the waiting room? Oh, admit three people waiting. Thank you. Hi, three people waiting. I'm Michelle, and this is the first time I've done this, so I didn't know I, I'm tripping my, I'm failing fast and failing often. How's that? Um, I love that, that saying, by the way. Another colorism. I mean, fail fast and fail often. As you go through and you send your, your handwritten notes, and then you know, you go back and think, oh, that was a stupid note. Um, no, it wasn't because you, you fail your way forward and the faster you fail, the faster you're gonna have success. You go door knocking and find yourself, you know, like it, it's like overcoming that, that 
monkey, that drunk monkey, I guess Keller Williams calls it, on our shoulders that keeps us from doing these things. Um, back to the handwritten okay. notes, yeah. I'm a very um, high I, kind of like that cheerleader. I don't know if you've noticed or not. Um, anyway, I go to Hobby Lobby and they have their paper sale and I get just really cool note paper and I go to the paper cutter and cut it in half. And, um, and then I write my notes and then I find a pretty color envelope and then maybe I put a sticker on it and then I tape my note to the top. Whatever you can do that just makes it fun because people like getting mail but all too often especially now, what do you get so much of, you know, and you just are so sick of all the political stuff, you put it in the garbage. So something fun is just going to be very helpful to you. I love, that's probably my favorite thing are the handwritten notes. Okay. Um, so we're going to jump ahead. I'm How looking, much traction have you got from the handwritten notes? Do you generate a lot of business from that? Um, wonderful like question. Wonderful yeah. question. And again, remember in the beginning I said um, you have to list to exist. And however that seller's market is, I mean, if it's a seller's market, if it's a buyer's market, the success that I have in note writing, I measure it over for 15 years I've been doing it. Um, let me back up a little bit to, I did some door knocking around the John Marshall neighborhood a couple years ago. I had a buyer coming to town, wanted to live over there. So I focused on um, door knocking over there. And I, I visited with an, a lady and she was so kind and she wasn't ready yet, but she was one then that I sent a handwritten note to. Um, and you didn't hear from her and then at Christmas time, I sent a Christmas card. And then I think, you know, I try to just send something personal um, once I call, you know, whatever I can do. Business, you're gonna get leads that are going to be successful for you six months, two years, five years down the road. So back to this door knocking over by John Marshall. Um, I, follow, I followed up with a handwritten note, sent her a Christmas card. I think mid-season I sent her another note, another Christmas card. Um, and then she called me like two years later. And, you know, she said, this is Betty. And it's like, and I remembered her because she was so sweet. And, um, and, and she was like, you remember me? And I said, well, yes, you know, you and your husband. And I said, you live over by John Marshall, right? And, and she just was that just thrilled that I remembered her. And she wanted me to know that she, that her and her husband are on a waiting list and she's, their home will be for sale. She's having trouble convincing her husband, but she's taking care of him. Anyway, um, within the next, by next spring, she's gonna be calling me to list her house. So after she called me then, then I went back and um, I have this big hydrangea bush behind my house that they're pretty and pink. So I cut a few hydrangea and I went and door knocked on their door. And first her husband answered and he was kind of surly, but then she came in behind him and I said, hi, you know, hi Bernard, I'm Michelle. And Betty's face just lit up. And when I gave her those flowers, I mean, she was so thrilled. And, and I knew that it's her that I needed to convince because she's caring for her husband who has dementia. And I made her feel important. I made her feel, I think I make her feel safe. And, um, and that's going to be business for me. I have a couple others. Um, ex I like to go after expires. That's kind of my favorite thing. And I send that handwritten note, how, what I do, um, you know, how can, how I can get their home sold. And I have two people that have, um, I wrote these back when COVID I loved it. When COVID first hit, all that lead generating, remember, you're going to do lead generating off and on for your career. I pulled out like the last five years of lead generating that I've done in handwritten notes. And I re-tapped out two more handwritten notes to like five people that I have touched in the past. And two of them reached back to me. And, and then when they reached back, then I went and again, I delivered hydrangeas one day. And she said, now you're going to come back, right? Um, that personal touch. Um, 
technology is really important and, and you younger agents that get the technology, but I'm 59 years young and um, I kind of have my philosophy is it's all about the relationship and that personal touch. Um, and, and so the market that I work with, a lot of them don't really interact with computers. And so five minutes, you know, or taking an hour to go door knocking um, or like right now, another thing to do is go to your favorite pumpkin patch and buy three pumpkins and then go and deliver a pumpkin to somebody and make their day. There's just so many little things that you can do. It don't cost a lot of money. Um, so I'm, I'm looking at, I'm not sure what PowerPoint it is, page 12. Um, it, it talks about staging the property, market the listing, and communicating with sellers. So we're going to move into that. Make it happen. Marketing and servicing your listing. Um, I like what it says, you know, fiduciary. We talk again, if you sell my listing, you are a seller's agent. Your fiduciary responsibilities are to your seller. And what is in your seller's best interest? Now, you can take these classes and you can write contracts. Um, the answer to everything that you do is in the contract. And I want to say the way that you deliver it is all within yourself. Um, that contract, if, and, and every transaction that you do, you're going to learn that contract more and more. My personal strive is when I turn in a listing to get 100%, I've been doing this for 15 years and I still don't get it right every time. I mean, it's, it's a continuum, fail fast and fail often because the more mistakes you make, the faster you learn and learn the first time. Um, fiduciary, a person who is legally or ethically both entrusted to manage money or property between two or more pop parties. Again, going back to that dual agency, that's a whole nother class, but as a seller's agent, your job is to market that listing to everybody out there and their agent, or probably, you know, really you're marketing to the agent and maybe a buyer might come in. But really when you market a listing, you're marketing so that agents can find that listing. Um, so we talked about, um, let me see here. I think um, Melanie talked about previewing. Um, there's, there's a lot of pages in here that talk about staging a property. When it is a buyer's market, like it was in 2008, 2009, 2010, our market crashed, um, staging, you're working for your client. So your job is to get the home sold. When it's a buyer's market, um, well, the home always needs to be staged, but you might put forth more effort in a buyer's market because you're, you have um, more buyers than you do, pro well, we still do have more properties than we do buyers, but um, sorry, I'm off track there. Staging the property. You can hire a professional stager. There's certain things that I'm going to share when I, um, when I list a property that um, you can hire a stager all the way from bringing things in to um, going through and using what the seller has. Um, the number one thing that I want to suggest, um, whether you have a stager or not, is that you have a professional photographer. Yep, it might cost you a hundred bucks, but that image that you put out there on the MLS that's, that's what people are looking at. Before they even look at the property information, they're looking at the MLS. So um, when you, you can preview property strictly on the MLS, well, the, there's a shortage. But when you go through and you look at something, I tell my client, when I list a house, I want you to go outside your front door. I mean, clean your house how you think you should, put things away, and then go outside your front door walk in, close your eyes, and then open them. And what do you see? What objections do you see? Um, oftentimes, you know, you have, might have to do that several times before you get things out of the way. Common objections are, we all know that, you know, take down the photo, you know, the personal photos, because we want to see the buyer feel comfortable in the house. Um, you also want the buyer to be able to move freely through the house. So if the house is 
is lived in, um, yeah, really just encourage them to find a storage unit to pack most of the toys away, most of the overflow in the closets. You don't want them to open the closet door and have everything fall out. You want them to see space because one thing that we never have is enough space. So you want to use the space the best that you can. So when a house is lived in, um, kind of what I say is I want it to look like a hotel. I want it to be that clean. And even if they have a lot of stuff when your photographer comes i'm there with them so if i and i tell my client i'm going to move things out of the picture because if they just can't bear to part with some of these things when the photographer is there i'm pulling things out so the pho photographer can do the shoot and then i will put the things back in hello okay um, I'm letting people back in. I'm learning to watch my um, So if a house is lived in, you can hire a stager. If, remember that the re real estate is all about the relationship. And so when you're having that listing presentation, you really want to be able to, I tell my clients that I want you to be able to ask me any question that you want. And in turn, I'm going to ask questions and I may say things that might hurt your feelings, but my goal is to get, you know, for me, it's business for you. It's personal. You know, if, if I'm finding that they're having a hard time with some of my suggestions, then I might consult with a stager and it's better to have a stager come in and make those suggestions um, so that they look like the bad person and not you. But as you, the, the best way that your client, you've got that listing, and, and I know Tyler, you have one, and Nick, you have a new one. <clears throat> um, you know, just keeping in touch with that client is the best thing that you, you can do. That communication is gonna help build that relationship and letting them know that, I mean, any question that they could, any question, there's no question, real estate business question that's, that's not off limits. Um, my, one of my favorite sayings is, and it applies to whether you are, uh, whatever you're selling yourself, my job is to provide you with the information that you need to make an informed real estate decision, to make an informed auto buying decision, to make an informed pre-funeral. I mean, whatever the things are, um, education, whatever it is that your role is, you know, wife, husband, sister, brother, parent, um, whatever that role is, real estate agent, your job is to provide them with information so that they can make an informed decision. Um, that's going, that's how you build the relationship. That's how they learn to trust you. And then you give them information and then they can come back at you, making them feel important, asking them questions. I mean, it's one thing to get the listing. And I tell my clients, okay, now I have the listing. Now my job is to get to know your house. And every time I do an open house, I get to know that property more and more and more. Now, really the reason we do open houses real estate teaches us is, is it is to pick up buyers but my philosophy is my job is to sell the house actually my job is to sell myself if people like the information that i'm providing about the property if people like my enthusiasm my passion my knowledge um then they're going to hire me so or, or they're going to keep my card and come back and call me um, getting to know the property and, and the way that you do that is by doing open houses and talking to the people that come through the door. Um, when somebody comes to my open house, the first thing I'm going to do is say, you know, with a smile, remember I said smile and then really mean it. And you feel that, that burst of, of energy that comes through your heart and out and a smile is so contagious and a smile is going to make people trust you and the first thing i say you know welcome to 423 lawrence boulevard how did you happen to come upon my open house i want to know that 
because is it through Facebook marketing? Is it through newspaper? Is it through my open house signs? Um, there's so many avenues that people can come to your open house. It's really important. That's just the opening question. You know, how did you find me? You want to know where are your dollars being spent? Um, that even the answer to that question has changed over the years where it used to be, um, you know, in the newspaper open house. Um, by the way, the reason, um, my opinion, the reason that you put your picture in the paper with open houses is because you're vain. You want to see your picture in the paper. Um, it's not about you. It's about the property and, and in the paper, that's the least effective, least effective um, source of, of lead generating and marketing. So put it into Facebook. Um, another thing that I have, and every property is going to be different upon the success. For instance, I have this wonderful, one of a kind property in Wabasha, Minnesota. Jenny, you saw it right there on the water, waterfront property. Wow. Um, I put a sign that says open house Saturday, 9.30 to 11 um, in the front yard. And, and I put flyers in the information box. I've gone through, I think I've killed a tree with the flyers. Everybody wants to know. And, but when they come through the front door, how did you happen upon this open house? Oh, I saw your open house sign when we were walking by. Now this property is right along the Mississippi River. So it is going to have a lot more foot traffic. But when you're marketing your listing, think about how what people are going to be walking by. If you're marketing a condo, well, putting an uh, information box out in front of the house, the, the a condo unit probably isn't going to do you much good. Um, in my case, being a waterfront property, there's a lot of people to walk by. It does. Um, social media is probably, I mean, by far, it's it's going to be your best avenue. So command, Facebook marketing, what I like about that. And again, I need, I haven't done it for probably about two months. So I need to relearn. I'm going to be reaching out to Lisa to help me. Um, but what happens with Facebook command marketing is people see your ad and they only see like two pictures. And if they want more information, Facebook must somehow grab a couple of sentences that get their attention. And then in order for them to see more, they have to register and they have to give you their email address and their phone number and their name. And 90% of them are legit. Um, I, I had Lady Gaga register one time, you know, some of them aren't, but for the most part, you have that number so you can follow up with them and say, hey, you know, I'm doing some, and, and I'm honest with these people, I'm doing Facebook marketing, I've never done it before, or I'm new at it, and I noticed that you registered on my listing, you know, tell me what you were thinking, and, um, or what your thoughts are, and you can engage in a conversation, whether it be, oh, I was just looking, and I had to register to see more, to, well, you know, this caught my eye, and you can provide information, you can send them when you have their email address. I don't know if you know this or not, but as the listing agent, you can send them the link to your listing. You register them in your contacts. And then when you send them that MLS link and they open it, you know that they opened it. So that's an, then you know that they received it. If you send it to them and they don't open it. You also know what you do is you go to your sent emails and then it'll tell you, it'll bring them all up and it'll tell you who's opened it or, or who hasn't, if it's never been opened. And that's another way to say, hey, you, you have their phone number and say, just wondering if you received the link to 423 Lawrence Boulevard that we were talking about. So there's a number of ways that give you an opportunity to reach out using that Facebook command marketing. And um, again, your goal as a listing agent is not to sell it yourself. Your goal is to put it out there for all of the agents and people that have money and to bring the best offer. And social media is by far the best way. Um, 
Another way you can do Craigslist. Um, I wanted to market my Lawrence Boulevard and Wabasha property. So I went on to Craigslist in Brainerd. I went to Craigslist, you know, I, I marketed it to all the mark to as many places as I could going individually on Craigslist to these different communities. Now you have to make sure that you identify yourself as a licensed realtor. When you do Facebook marketing, do not go to your newspaper, your main page and market yourself as a realtor. You're gonna come upon all kinds of problems. And even though I know I see it done, don't do it. You have to um, disclose that you are a licensed realtor with Keller Williams Premier Realty licensed in Minnesota. Um, build a business page if you haven't. And um, that's where you do your marketing through. But what I've learned is you can no longer, I used to be able to share my link, my listing link to Facebook and market that way and do boosts and stuff, but you can't do it that way anymore. Um, the only way that I know of to market your listing on Facebook is to do it through command. And I'm gonna have to um, get back on that next week. Um, so I'm kind of intermixing together here, but back to staging the property. Um, my pet peeve, um, biggest one ever, close the toilet seat. Do not have any photos out there online with an open toilet seat. Um, close the toilet seat every time. Um, that's just gross. Um, if you're gonna hire a professional photographer, um, you tell your client that you're hiring a professional photographer. Um, when I'm talking to my clients, you know, part of that communication is understanding, I don't get paid until the end, but I'm dishing out, if I'm paying a stager, I'm dishing out the photographer, all of my, my dues and my MLS key and all of my marketing, everything is paid for in advance. And I don't get paid until the property closes. So if, if I lose the listing, then I'm out those all those dollars. And so it goes back again to that communication, staging the property. Um, right now, be, with pretty much all houses selling relatively quickly, um, staging looks a little bit different. Um, I always try to make sure, I mean, that the house is clean and everybody has Am I there? I think I hit a button. Okay. Everybody has different ideas of what a house, what clean looks like, but um, getting the dirty clothes off the floor and you can look at listings out there that seriously have dirty clothes on the floor. Um, before I sold real estate, when I bought my first house um, and I didn't buy my first house till I was 42 years hey, Katie, old. I've been thinking about you. Oh, <laughs> oh, Cindy. Good, how are you? Cindy, Cindy, Cindy. Um, yes, it is. It you, is. You can mute her. I can't. How do I? How? Go to participants and then go on her name and just push me. You're listening. Um, you mute yourself. Just a minute. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. How do I do it? Hold on. Cindy, can you see? Yeah. Um, <laughs> I think she figured it out. I'm not sure how to, um, oh, participants, here we go. Okay, can you all hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, if a property is vacant, um, right, especially right now when it's, it really is a seller's market, there's a shortage of inventory, I'm not gonna hire a stager to come in and stage the property. Um, but what I do do, and being in real estate for 15 years, I have things that I can use. Like um, I try to, if it's an empty house, it's kind of stark and barren. So I do things that maybe try and um, make a room stand out instead of be dark and barren. So if I have a, a I have a, um, a fun little chair um, and then I put a rug and maybe a, a table with a, um, a flower or something, just something that draws the attention to the room that makes you kind of say, oh, that's cute, instead of just seeing a bare room. If, if it's a room that would make a good 
good kids room. Maybe I'll find, you know, a big pink elephant and I'll just put it in, in the corner of the room to kind of draw them across the room or, or into the closet if it's a big closet or something, you know, if the closet has shelves. Something, I try to find a little something to make every room. In a bathroom, maybe it's just putting up a shower curtain. Um, um, everybody has Thing, you know, I just try to make a room look a little bit more inviting. Um, now, if you have a million dollar listing, you know, then maybe you want to hire a stager. Again, the, um, the expense falls on you. And it's having that discussion with your client. If your client is moving out, maybe they can leave a few pieces in there. Um, to, to kind of to solve that because when you have a or get the photographer in there before everything is removed from the house so you have those pictures and then just try to highlight different areas in the house and so staging the property um, market the listing again there's so many that's your job as as a seller's agent sell sell this listing your job is to market the agent or to market the listing you are not um Another word that I want you to change is when you are talking about your commissions, it is not commissions, it is marketing fees. You have a marketing fee of 7% and you pay out, you know, 4% goes to your broker, 3% goes to the agent who ever sells the listing. And then from that, and I tell, you know, how do I get paid? From that 4%, my broker gets their cut and I pay my marketing, my photographer, my dues, all of that. So all those expenses. Um, so it's your marketing expense and you cooperate, you share that marketing expense with other agents. It is commission, but if you use it as a marketing, because right away, <laughs> that seller is thinking, oh, look, at they're going to make $20,000. Well, okay, so let's take that and break it in half. First of all, or if you're 6%, we'll keep it easy, 6%, 3% goes to the listing agent, 3% goes to the selling agent. If I am the um, buyer's agent and I show them this is how I get paid, I get paid 3%, no, excuse me, my broker gets paid 3%, and after my broker takes their 36%, then I get the remaining, and then I have to pay my taxes to Uncle Sam. I have to pay my photographer, my advertising, all of those things. So how you present, how you get paid is really important because all of a sudden you're not making $20,000, you're really making five. So being able to show how your business is conducted. That's part of the relationship. That's part of how you sell yourself so that your client believes in you. And um, one thing that I've, you know, nothing makes you feel better than when you call your client and then they thank you for the phone call. They look forward to your phone call. Um, so that communication with sellers, these three things, you know, make it happen. Marketing and servicing your listing. Your job is to sell it. Your job is to market it to all of the people out there that have money, other agents. And um, if other agents aren't seeing your listing, let me tell you, here's an inside tip. If you have a listing right now, pay attention to this because this is gonna help you see who is seeing your listing. Um, you go to your, your dashboard and you click on my active and coming soon listings. And then that takes you down below where you can email, reverse prospect, share. I want you to look at that reverse prospecting key. And when you look at that reverse prospecting key, that's going to tell you, and, and I look at this, my eight, once my listing goes live, I am looking at that from the very beginning because I want to see how many um, agents have a home of my within my parameter it tells me which agents have sent my listing to people and then when they um when a buyer sees it if they like it they can mark it with an a light bulb 
Um, I had a listing up on Northern Heights Drive and I put it out there. I went to that reverse prospecting key. Um, like I, it went on in the afternoon that evening. I looked at that reverse prospecting key and I had five hearts on that house. Now I don't know the people that put the hearts, but when you go into your, when you go into um, your contacts, all of your contacts have a number next to them, an ID number. And so if, you, if your listing has like a heart by it, you can call that agent and say, okay, Sonda Featherstone, you had buyer number such and such that put a heart next to my listing. Um, so they can then reach out to that client and contact them. So that reverse prospecting key, if I have my listing and I'm looking at that and I see that it hasn't gone out, nobody has, no agents have sent it out in a week or two weeks, then I need to do something that's going to bring my listing back up and center. So whether that's a command post, um, whether that's editing the verbiage, changing the price, there's a number of things that you can do that change your listing and basically boomerang it back out there under the market. Um, so I wanna stop, does this make sense? Um, Tyler, Nick, can you see that, um, that reverse prospecting? I see what you're saying. I just haven't put any listings on command yet. So Got it. Okay. In the process of it, but I'll definitely be researching. Uh, it. No, like, you don't. Uh, nope. Not on command. Your listing, go into your MLS. It's in your MLS. So I see that you're on your computer. Okay. So so go to your dashboard and then click on all my active and coming soon listings. And you can only do this if you're the listing agent. If you're a co-listing, you can't do it. Only the listing agent. This is a huge tool for you. So um, those of you that don't have any listings yet, just remember me, I'm Michelle. When you get your first listing, contact me and I'll tell you about that reverse prospecting key. But when you, you have to highlight, like your listing, you have to put a check in the box. And then, yeah, it's going to tell you. I'm, I, <clears throat> you take a few minutes to look for that. Let me know when you find it, if you do, or I'll help you. Because you're going to have, that's going to be your big aha of the day. To be able to see what your listing is doing and how you need to kind of reactivate it and refresh it. I am looking, so I, you have it. You have your listing up. Okay, Jenny, thank you. So you have your listing up. It's on your dashboard. And yes, I do. Okay, and so you have to check it. Put put a check mark in the box on the far left corner. Okay. And then down below, you should see you can email it. You can print it. Yep. We, yep. Okay, click on that reverse prospecting tab. Okay, I'm clicking, click, come on. Okay. What oh. do you see? Oh yeah, I see a bunch of people, yes. Isn't that the coolest thing? <laughs> I mean, so you can look at that and you can see, it tells you the, the dates, you know? So if, if you know, um, and I haven't figured out if it ever ends or if it refreshes like every 30 days. But when I look at mine, um, I can see back in, you know, six months ago that it was, it was still um, when it first came on. But anyway. So on that count, it, does that count mean the amount of times that they clicked it? Okay. So no, what that means is, so, so look at, you, you have the, on the far left-hand corner, you have the name of a agent correct you correct. have the agent's name and then there's a like a i think a five digit number next to it or correct. somewhere along there that is their contact so if you wanted to call that agent and say contact number and in your contacts in your mls you have to build the contacts um they're assigned a number so that tells that agent 
um, which contact that listing went to. And these agents probably have that client set up on an auto search. And so when your listing came on the market, it fit in those parameters and it was emailed to them. So if in the course of that, all of a sudden you look on that and you can see, you know, if what time, if it's new, it'll tell you like it went out at six o'clock at eight o'clock. And then it'll say it went out on Tuesday, it went out on Wednesday. Um, and then it'll just after, a, after like four days, then it just gives you the date that it went out. But another number that you see, so um, you might see a number seven, you might see 533. There's a, a column of numbers, and what that tells you is that particular contact, that agent has sent seven listings to, or 500 listings to. So when you look at your list, uh, your, your um, line by line, and you see numbers of varying degree, I like to see numbers that are five, six, seven, 10, maybe 20, but if, if if it seems like this agent has sent 500 listings to, well, they're probably not a real good lead. But then when you go back, maybe a few days later, all of a sudden you might see a light bulb show up. That means somebody's watching it. Or you might see a heart. That means that there's a buyer that loves the property. Well, if you see a heart or a light bulb, then you look over to which agent has that buyer and you call that agent and say, hey, buyer number 500, you know, 53421 has put a heart next to my listing on Lawrence Boulevard. So you can kind of give them a heads up. Um, so that's how you interact with other agents. There's so Thank many you. different ways to sell your listing and that's your job not yourself your job is to market it out there for everybody to see and so when you look at your reverse prospecting tab you will um that gives you some ideas there to reach out so you have facebook you do a command you can get contact information there of of buyers okay of customers facebook command gives you customers um North Star MLS reverse prospecting gives you real estate agents that have clients. Um, I'm going to stop and does anybody have questions, thoughts, comments? Thank you very much. That was a very nice little bit of information. Isn't that amazing? And yeah. it surprises me how many agents do not know about that and um that would be that's probably worth that's worth so much so glad you could see it jenny and um tyler nick uh, i hope that you can well um tyler this is tyler still with us okay um Anybody else have any comments, thoughts? So where does it pop up on my? Okay. I have it once I get a listing in there. So I, for example, I just click new listing and then like a new listings there in St. Michael. Um, right. So it'll only come. Yeah. You, you have to have a listing in order to see it. It, it. You won't be able to look under anybody else's, but, um, it, the thing is, is you go to your dashboard and you look for my active and coming soon listings and then you exit. So like if you're going to select three properties, you check that little box um, and then um, you can bring up any listings. You're right. So if, if you have um, properties in front of you, put an X by them and then you, you're given, you won't see reverse prospecting, but you will see print email oh, okay, okay. Cool. so yep. if you don't have a listing you won't have that reverse prospecting opportunity but once you have a listing out there that will pop up to you good question thank you very much any questions on staging 
What do you typically pay a stager to come in and just kind of give out suggestions on how to do stuff, move things around, like a hundred bucks? Um, I haven't used a state. Well, I've been doing this myself a long time. The best, so I would, for you, I would just call up a couple stagers. I can't even really give you any names. I'm sure there are um, people in our group that can, and if not on our class right now, just within the office. Um, Cindy could probably tell you some, I know Cindy could probably tell you somebody. Lori Mangan can share some, there's, people have their stagers. So I would just get a couple of names um, and I would just call and ask them. And, and I love that question and I really appreciate it because that gives me another thought here. Your job is to sell a listing. Another thing you might want to do is once you have your listing, take that MLS sheet and go visit a couple of banks, meet with a couple of lenders and say, hey, I have this listing. How can you help me? They have ways that they can help market your listing. You also, they can maybe even give you a, a sheet that talks about um, with, with your listings picture on it that talks about financing options so that when you are doing an open house and somebody comes through and you know first you ask them how did you find out about my open house then they go through the house um, I like depending upon the home and the number of people I like to tour people through the house if they're not open to that I just kind of stand back and share different things about the property but um, if you have a lender, you know, if, if they're new buyers and, and another thing I want to find out from the very beginning, you know, I, you know, what brings you to the house? They're going to tell you, oh, we were walking by, we're just looking, we're neighbors, whatever it might be. They all have feedback for you. Every person that comes through has feedback, even the nosy neighbors. They're the best because they might be more willing to be a little bit more critique. And quite frankly, when I ask for feedback from people, I don't want to know the warm fuzzies. I want to know what their objection is because it's through the objection that the property is sold every time. So don't look for the warm fuzzies. You want the objections. The objections are going to help you get the property sold. Um, um, I'm, I'm on page 16 that just different ideas of marketing your listing. Um, you know, there's a lot of things that talks about your database and your database is important. It is so important. You need to feed your database, but it still is down to the relationship and the personal service. So um, somebody comes to the open house and remember really, truly the reason you have open houses is to get buyers. And so you follow up with that during that open house, your job really is just to sell it. You provide information on the house. You ask them if they have questions. And then you, you have them sign in. You get their contact information. Um, I don't need their address. Really, what I want most of all is their email address and a phone number. Um, if they're homeowners, you can kind of get that through a discussion and you can get their address through the tax record. So I like the email address and the phone number. I probably like the email address best because I use a tool to, um, remember you're selling yourself, I use BombBomb. And I don't know if anyone's ever heard of BombBomb, but there's other things out there. You can send a video email even from your phone. But if you have somebody's, I like BombBomb because I know when I send out a video to somebody, I know when they've opened it, I know when they've played it, I know if they played it 10 times and I get a little bit, you know, but um, BombBomb is, a, is another, I guess you'd call it a CRM because you can do um, pre-arranged. So if somebody calls your phone and you can automatically send a pre-made video to them um, or if you get their email, I mean, you can just say, hey, you know, this is Michelle and I got your message. I'm, I'm in the middle of, I'm with a client right now, but I'll reach out to you again real soon. Um, another way, I love BombBomb. Next to my handwritten notes, I'd say BombBomb is probably the most effective because um, even if they don't respond, they remember you and you want people to remember you for the right reasons, for the right reasons. And 
that smile, that true smile, that handwritten note. Those are things that make you stand out from everybody does technology these days. You find things that make you stand out. Um, you just be kind. You just be kind. Um, there's, depending upon your, you know, I'm a boomer, so I don't use, I, I, I don't know, I don't understand tweet. I understand Facebook. That's it. I don't tweet. I don't know any of that other stuff. Snapchat. Um, but, and, and I think Snapchat is real big. Um, but these are all ways, whatever means you choose, instead of trying to do it all, just pick one that you're comfortable with and do it well. Um, they, you know, for me, it's, it's Facebook and Craigslist. Um, I'm bummed that I can't make a post on my business page and attach my, my listings so that I can link that to my personal page. Um, I can't do that any longer. So when I do a Facebook command post, I really don't know what it looks like. I just know what I get in return. And there's probably a way to find out, um, but I get, I am ab able to capture the leads. Um, again, that communication, I wanna stress, it's the relationship, communicating with the seller. Um, it's important to recognize your schedule as well as your clients, you know, and, and your boundaries, you know. If you don't want somebody calling you at five o'clock in the morning or at 10 o'clock, like me, I go to bed at like eight, 8.30. And so, you know, like for me, my business day is done at seven o'clock. Um, when I, and I communicate and I call or I text and with my clients, um, but if a client says that they want you to call them every day, um, you better work on that relationship because that's a tough one. I, I wouldn't have time. I would probably, I probably refer that buyer to one of the newer agents that needs some experience. Um, that that's a tough one. Um, but establishing those, uh, you know, communication. I'm going to contact you. Be careful. Try to keep it vague. Like um, I had one agent that said, "Well, I'm going to contact you every Tuesday." Well, then by golly, you better. And, and it worked out really well for the first few weeks. And then after that, over the course of a listing, that kind of fell off. But you could very easily say that I'm, I'm, I'm going to contact you at least once a week. It might be a text message. It might be a phone call. It might be an email. Um, maybe both. I like to, I do, when I'm working with my sellers, I do what I call a real estate review. And so I just send them, you know, here's a real estate review of the last couple of weeks, you know, and just kind of highlighting your, your home was shown on this date. This was the feedback. Um, I sent out a, um, I, I put 20 flyers in the information box and two days later they were all gone. Um, whatever you can tell them that shows that you're doing something for them. I received a phone call. Um, I like doing an email because then it's documented there. Documenting is so important. And text message, messaging is good too for that documentation, but an email allows you to be a little bit more personal. If you can do that email, like through BombBomb, I can do a real estate review through BombBomb and just, you know, a two minute video and then type the, you know, um, condensed version. And then you know that they've opened it, you know that they've seen it. You just, Communication, that's, that's how you market the listing and let them know what you're doing. If you, um, you know, like Jenny, you just found that reverse prospecting. That is a huge opportunity for you. And to share with your seller, I can see that your home has gone out to other agents 12 times this week, or it hasn't gone out in the last week. We need to do something. So do we need to change our verbiage? Do we need to change something a little bit so that it booms ring, boomerangs back out there? Uh, 
Um, we haven't talked about, let's talk about pricing a listing and how to come up with that price. Um, that also changes so much with the market and depending upon what kind of property that you have that you're marketing. But I want to share a few of the tools that I use when I'm doing, trying to come up with a price range and, and providing that information. My job is not to price the property. My job is to provide my client with information so that they can make the decision of where they want to be priced. Um, there's, I'm going to give you another, this is a tip here. Okay. Here's another, when you look at pricing, um, $299,000 versus $300,000. By pricing the property $100 more, you double your exposure. Who wants to know how that happens? Does anybody know how that happens? Yes, Nick. Tyler, sorry, no, Nick. Tell me more. Ah, okay. Um, so what I want you to do is everybody get a piece of paper. And on that top of the paper, I want you to write $299. And I want you on another column, I want you to write $300,000. Okay, got that? So now let's focus on the $299. Somebody has $300,000 to spend, right? So they're going to put in for a price point. And I want you to write down 250 to 300,000 and then kind of do a carrot top. So if somebody, if your home is priced at 299,000 and they are looking in 250 to 300,000, your home is gonna fall into that price point, right? Okay, now go over to 300,000 and I want you to write 300 to 350. So let's say that your home is priced at 300,000. Somebody is going to do a search and below that 300, I want you to write 250 to 300. So your home falls into that 250 to 300. Well, what if they have $310 to, or 310,000? You price it at 300,000, your home is going to fall into that 250 to 300 and that 300 to 325. Do you see it? Makes sense. I mean, you've just doubled your exposure. Again, your job is to market that house. So pricing strategy, when you go out there and you look on the MLS, this is a, um, I don't know, I discovered this, I don't know, several years ago. And to this day, when I look at a property that's marked 199,000, I say, still bad. Well, I don't like that word, so I don't, but that's poor marketing. If I see something that's priced 249 instead of 250, again, you're you're cutting your exposure in half. So if if you're when you're pricing properties, you know, I mean, if a home can't be pushed, you know, if, if a home is can't go any higher than 310, then you can't do it. Um, you know, for that 325, but just recognize those price points, um, 199 versus 200, um, 224 versus 225. Um, do you all get it? Does that make sense? Okay. Um, that's another, that should be another aha. Reverse prospecting and pricing. Um, other tools that I use when I try to determine price, I look at the tax record. I like RPR is another tool. If you haven't used RPR, there's an opportunity for you to um, explore. 
in its simplest terms, you can type in any address anywhere in the United States, actually probably anywhere in the world for that goes, and you are able to bring up information on that property. And it'll give you kind of a, a, a ballpark range. Now I guarantee you that the ballpark range on RPR is going to be different from the ballpark range in the tax record, but it still kind of gives you an idea of uh, it, it gives you numbers, it gives you information when you go about pricing a property. A, another um, home, let me see. Oh, does, that sound, does that stand for, is that the Realtors Property Resource? Yes. Okay, because it's like NAR PR, so. Did they change the name? <laughs> okay. So yeah, if you Google it, it comes up, but it's N-A-R-R-P-R. -R -R okay, maybe uh, they changed that. that. Um, also, if you're on your dashboard under links so um, you can get um, on your dashboard you can get transaction desk you can get showing time you can get rpr you can get home snap all of these things you can get from your mls dashboard um, the other tool that i like oh i'm at a total blank here um the white home, page is premium home snap is real good I have not, again, there's so many things that you can learn. I should learn home snap, but um, I haven't yet. Um, oh, if I think of it, there's another source, but, but, and so I use RPR, I use the tax record and I use one other, and then I'll run searches looking at, you know, so if, if I kind of think that my home is gonna be priced, let's say, well, I'm thinking it's going to be between 250 and 300. Then I'm going to look at all homes out there on the market that are active on the market between 250 and 300 to see how that competition lies. You know, um, if I'm going to see that, you know, if I have a home that's 30 years old, well, I can get rid of the new construction because it doesn't compare with the new new construction. Um, the, the piece that I use is that if somebody wants new construction. I don't care how nice your house is. If somebody wants new construction, they want new construction and there's really nothing you can do with your home. So I take that out of there, but I do need them to know that, you know, your home is priced at the same price point. Somebody could buy a new home for this, but it's information. Obviously a new home isn't gonna give them near the amenities that an existing home pre-built already has. But um, again, there's, just just a vast number of ways that you can use to market your property. You know, staging, pricing. Um, another thing, and that's where uh, I think Facebook command comes in, is kind of profiling. So if you have, um, you know, a 3,000 square foot, two story in Southwest, um, four bedrooms up, um, Understanding who's going to be the buyer for that home. It's probably not going to be a 60 year old um, baby boomer. Maybe, you know, it might be, but probably not. It's probably going to be more to somebody that, that has a family with kids and they can have all their kids on one level. And so when you reach out to do marketing, figuring, okay, that's kind of the target that I want. Now you cannot, um, you can't discriminate on age, so be careful when you do your marketing, but in your mind as you're setting up that buyer profile, where's this buyer coming from, you can use that in your means. So for instance, um, maybe you know I have this 3,000 square foot two story in Southwest Rochester, it might be a doctor that wants to live there, or it might be a, um, you know, a, a 30 year old, and what do they use for marketing? You know, they may not use Facebook, but they may tweet or they may Snapchat or they may whatever that is. So um, profiling your buyer and marketing accordingly to how you might pick up that buyer. Okay. Oh, I have somebody waiting. Oh, maybe. Admit. Tyler, I'm sorry. 
Hope you haven't been waiting long. There we go. Um, okay. So we're going to kind of go back again to open houses and really conducting an open house. Um, the open house is to find buyers, but I really want to say to you that your job is to sell the home and the best opportunity that you have is during an open house. And the more you try and um, provide information on the house, the better you get at it and the better it makes you look. When I have, um, I did an open house last weekend and I have this unique property in Wabasha, but um, a buyer came through and I spent a half hour with him and, and he was eager to receive. I mean, this is a very historic home and there's just so much information that I've learned. And when he got all done, I mean, he just said, I, I need to get my wife and I need to bring her through. And, and at that time there was another customer coming in and he said, you did so well, do me a favor and don't do that with them. And um, when people say that, it's like, I'm not coming across as pushy. I'm providing them with information so that they can make an informed decision. Yes, the home doesn't have a garage, but understand that the home was built in 1890. There were not cars back in 1890. So there's room for a garage. If there were a garage, the price would be higher. You know, recognizing when you get the objection, learning how to overcome that objection. When you do an open house, really, I want you to look for the objections because it's through the objection that the sale is made. Um, and it may not be that particular um, customer, but somebody else will come in with the same objection and then you're prepared on how to handle it. You know, uh, my Lawrence Boulevard listing when I first took over, I mean, it's like there's no garage, but it took me getting to know the house, looking at the market, looking at my RPR, looking at my tax base, looking at competition, recognizing that I've got a one of a kind property here and my job is to market the listing. So I'm very passionate um, I, about getting to know what you're selling. Um, I think, let's see, was it Tyler? You said you're, you have a lot, a plot or a lot of land. And that's a little bit harder to market, but you can still do it because you still have that reverse prospecting. So as you look at trying to sell that lot, you, you try to do a buyer profile. Who's going to buy this? What kind of home is going to go on this lot? Um, can you reach out to a lender and get some financing options? Can you, if you have a lot, Reach out to a couple of builders. If you can find one, that would be kudos to you. See if you can find a couple of builders and find out what they would build on here so that you have information to provide to the buyer. It may not be what this buyer wants, but you have your open house list, you have your contacts, and all of a sudden you're gonna come upon something and you remember somebody from an open house a few months ago, and that's how you put things together. Uh, property that you bring on the market next month, you're obtaining, you're making your calls, you're getting your leads, you're finding out what they want, and um, lead generating, um, that's your job, and it's, it's bringing, putting things together. I know one of you earlier said it's, it's like the more buyers and the more sellers that you can find, the more likely that you can bring, bring things together, so you just keep track of things, even if it's a couple years old, never throw it, never throw it, unless you can rationally say, it's a dead end, sold, sold, sold. I mean, if you know that it's done, discard it. But when you go through, it's, it's a really a good time to review your, your marketing is like in January. In January, try to pull everything together because that's kind of a slow month as we're getting started. And January, February, we're gearing up to get started and the market really begins again, probably mid-February. So January is kind of a good month to maybe really do that, that lead gen and reach out to, to past and, and see, you know, we're coming up into the spring, you know, where are you at? And with COVID, that's changed everything and people like that phone call 
And so, you know, where are you at? You know, are you thinking next spring you might? You know, okay, I'm going to keep my eyes open for you. And again, you, you get their email address, you put them in your contacts on your North Star MLS, and whenever a listing comes up, even if they're not in the market, you send it to them because you know when they open it, you know if they're paying attention. If they're not paying attention, then you can follow up with a phone call. If they are paying attention, you can follow up. Hey, you know, did you happen to, and, and even if it's just touching base, you know, hey, I sent you this really cool listing up in, in Country Club Manor that's um, a three car garage. Did you happen to see it? You know that they did because you know that they opened it, but it gives you a chance to say, you know, does this look like something in the future that you might be interested in? Top of mind, um, you keep up those, just those touches and they remember you. You send them a, um, monthly newsletter even if they don't open it they still see your name so make sure that in the in the subject you have something you know your name and something fun so even if they don't open the newsletter they still see your name and you're brought to top of mind we're going doing really well here in time I feel like I've talked pretty much all. Um, boy, I mean, it's, it's, it's just that communication, that relationship. Um, I think we're going to be done early here. I think what I'd like to do is take this time right now. And um, I want to know, Okay, I've got 11 of you on here. Oh, no, Fitz 11. That's not 11 people. Um, I, okay, Lisa, um, I want to hear from you because you came on late. I didn't get a chance to talk to visit with you at all. Um, how long have you been in real estate and how are you doing with your numbers? Hi. Um, yeah, so I'm pretty new to real estate. We just joined um, KW in July. Um, numbers wise, we're doing okay. Um, we own and operate a cleaning company in Onalaska, Wisconsin. Um, okay. We've been extremely busy with that. I don't, it's probably, you know, the COVID thing. So everybody is right. wanting more and more cleaning. So um, we're struggling with the balance a little bit right now and finding that we need some off self. So we're working on that and interviewing people and all that good stuff. Um, but in the meantime, what we've been doing is just taking every opportunity while we're working in our cleaning company, um, to make those touches, you know, in person. So, yes. um, I would say, you know, notes I we've sent out, um, probably like 10 or 11 like notes and cards and and that kind of thing to people that you know we think might be um more likely to be getting into the real estate industry um you know within the next year um we mention real estate to literally everybody we speak to when we're doing like site visits and and that kind of thing um we you know hung out with our neighbors this last weekend and they had some friends from like an hour away or whatever. So we took the opportunity to, you know, talk to all of them about real estate. Um, so, I mean, I'd say we're doing okay. We could definitely be doing better, um, but we just need the time. So yeah, that's where we're at. And yes, you, you have a business. So first of all, um, you have different forms of income coming in, which is what a real estate agent is supposed to do. And you work your business right now it is, I just want to say everybody, it is really hard to get listings because we have such a shortage of real estate compounded by the fact that of COVID-19 and the main reason is, and, and I tell my prospects that come through, you know, seriously people, there has never been a better time in the history of mankind to buy, sell, or invest in real estate. Interest rates are the best that they've ever been. The problem that we have is that there's a shortage and people are 
because of the interest rates, they are refinancing and investing into their home. Um, they're, they're staying put. And so Lisa, what you're doing is you're able to, you're building up a clientele that you can put, I mean, your database should be growing daily. And, and as a way, these folks may not be buyers today, but six months from now, a year from now, two years from now, your lead generation is not for it, it. Usually the way that we work is we do our lead generation, we get busy with our business and then we stop. That's the way that like almost everybody does it. But truly most of your leads are in the future. They're, they're in your mets. They're the people that you're meeting now that don't have a need today. Um, then you have your script, you know, when you meet somebody who do you know that might be interested in buying, selling, or investing in real estate. Another thing about scripts, um, I know that they feel uncomfortable and, and canned, and I think the big thing, think about scripts as learning a language. When you're taking Spanish or French or German, and you trip your way through these, and you learn one word at a time, and then you learn how to put sentences together, and eventually, over time, then that sentence has, instead of it just being a textbook sentence that you put together, it becomes you. And so keep doing the scripts and recognize that the scripts, they, they help keep you focused. But the more comfortable you get with real estate, um, the better you're gonna get. And the scripts, they're delivered with you. They're delivered with your style. Um, not all scripts you're comfortable with. So take what you want and leave the rest. Um, you mentioned note cards. I love that. Um, I think you missed the beginning part, but I want to say that for me, the handwritten note has probably been in my 15 years, the one that has produced me the most effective means of lead generation. And it's not an immediate. Those handwritten notes um, follow up six months, a year, two years later. If you, you don't need to necessarily reach out. I mean, okay, KW, sorry. They want you to reach out like 33 touches. But if, if you can touch base four times a year so that you stay top of mind, you know, you can look for a re at, you know, we've got Thanksgiving coming up. That's a great time. All KW classes will tell you. It's a time not to enter, not to say that you're in real estate. Don't even mention you can just say, this is Michelle Babcock, you know, with Keller Williams Realty. And I just wanted to reach out and say how thankful I am. You know, uh, I admire you or whatever you want to say to people, you know, kind of sit down at a typewriter or a computer and type yourself up just a quick little script that you can reach out and give thanks and wish them a happy Thanksgiving. And there's your touch. And then uh, I wouldn't worry about it at Christmas time unless you want to wait till Christmas time and send them a note. Um, Thanksgiving's a little bit more personal because a lot of people send Christmas cards, but they don't know always do the Thanksgiving. So instead of do Thanksgiving and then follow up in January with another handwritten note or a phone call, however you want, um, video email, I can't, I, we've talked a little bit about it, but I'm telling you that's going to take your business to a whole new level um, because people like handwritten notes and they like videos. They like to see your smiling face. Um, okay, ahas, who wants to share? The reverse prospecting for your listings will be huge, most definitely in the uh, North Star MOS. Yes. Um, bomb bomb was good as well. Um, how to, yeah, definitely round your numbers up to 300,000 or 350, if that makes sense, mm -hmm. of Good. being that $1 off. Um, Tammy, tell me something, Tammy. Oh, it's, oh. It makes it difficult. I mean, you've had a really good class today. I really enjoyed Thank it. Thank you, um, I appreciate that. Can you think of something that I guess you're, you're going to do? Oh, the thing that I am going to do? Well, I'm going to learn how to do some more uh, 
I think it's on command how to do like the homekeeper or whatever it's called, Twilio, and do some advertising that way. Okay. And see what I come up with. I've done door knocking. It's not my favorite, but I've done it. Sure. Yep. I'm going to try to do some of that stuff. Um, not so let me, let me share with you a little bit door knocking, how door knocking can work for you. Because I hear you all say that you have buyers, but you don't have properties. So look at your buyer. You have your buyer profile. Then find a neighborhood that fits your buyer profile. And then you go out, you knock on doors. And, and quite frankly, you say, hey, I have a buyer. Do you want to sell? Why not? You don't need to worry about this whole long script. Um, and I suppose do like you're saying, um, you like expireds. Um, I did call a canceled and expired. Uh -huh. Brody yesterday, um, of course, just got their answer machine and just left a message. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to try to do some of that stuff also. Yeah. And um, one caution right now, as I think, because I do like expires, but everything is selling. So when a home has expired off the market, I just want to encourage you to take a little bit of time to study it because if, if you want to go after the listing, great, but you, you might want to know why it didn't sell. And if, right. if, if a home hasn't sold, there's a reason why. So if you can figure that out beforehand, um, and one of the things that you can do, here's another tip for you. So if you have a listing, I mean, go to your dashboard and, and click on any listing, you just check it, and then go to the history. If you go to the history tab, that's going to tell you Everything, the day and the time that it came on the market, the day and time that it went, that it took a price reduction, that it went to inspection, um, that they added pictures, that they changed the verbiage. So when you look at the history on the MLS of a listing, you can learn a lot from that. So if you see a home that's been on the market for three years and you can see everything, you can look at the old listing and... Mm -hmm. See if, you know, you can see who previous listing agents were. Um, there's just a lot that you can learn about an expired. There's a lot you can learn about every single listing in the MLS just by going to the history tab. Right. And I've tried for sale by owners, but sometimes they're kind of tricky. <laughs> it's, a, it, it's a different script. And it really is, um, whether you do FISBOs or... Um, I find FISBOs a lot harder than I do expires because, right. um, and, and part of that, as you sell, recognizing your personality. I mean, some, I don't know if you, if any of you have heard of a disc profile, I don't even know what Keller Williams now uses, but recognizing the disc profile basically is that drive. Does somebody have, I mean, they are totally focused, get out of the way. They know what they're doing. Um, that I is that interpersonal, that cheerleader is kind of what I am, a lot of energy. Um, do you have um, DIS is systems, you know, I need a system, I need my database, I need my whatever you need, you have your systems in place and that's how you operate. Um, and then the C is compliance, you know, you have to do it by the rules recognizing we're all all of those things but we all have a character in us that comes out stronger and that's kind of how we lead and because i'm a very exuberant person if i'm meeting somebody that's a d you know that's very all business you know no enthusiasm just business i know that i need to turn myself down um with that being said i have discovered that my enthusiasm is what people like. So um, again, I wanna say, I don't think Lisa heard it, but one of the things that I, the biggest takeaway, I want you all to understand that your success in real estate is contingent only upon yourself and what you're willing to do to apply. What, you know, you chose KW, and I mean, I could go on forever and ever why I love KW. They saved my life, I have a story but I've learned my business. Um, KW is the best and you are never short of classes. 
do you have to pay for them? Well, maybe not this one you don't, but to go with win with buyers, win with sellers, bold, um, family reunion, mega camp, Yes, they cost you money. Yes, they're expensive, but nothing good is free. And if everything was just given to you, how hard are you gonna work for it? So I believe that yes, you do have to pay for some of these things, but I guarantee it's gonna be worth it. It is gonna be so worth it. Your success in real estate is contingent only upon yourself and what you're willing to do. It's not what anybody else thinks about you. Um, you just, Figure out your business model. Chris, are you really in Florida or do you just have a backdrop behind you? Oh, I can't hear you. I see you. Oh, I think you have to unmute. Can anybody else hear him? Still can't hear you, bud. No, yeah. I can't hear him. Hmm. Okay. Well, I'm assuming he can hear us because he's still there. Is uh, it? Can you hear me now? Is that oh, better? Oh, we go. Okay. Now yes. I was just saying I've got a background set up so you can't see my dog destroying things in the background. <laughs> uh, every once in a while, I can see something pop up or you see things. So, okay. Now, yeah. I, well, I like that. That's very nice. <laughs> <laughs> Especially when if you're in northern Minnesota, we're gonna get we're supposed to get some snow. Right. Um, okay, anybody else? We, we're like, other than the ahas, I think we've, we've covered everything. Maybe not in the order in which we were supposed to, but we've pretty much um, covered everything. Um, uh, more ahas. Anybody else have something they wanna share? Everybody is done. Okay. Well, uh, I don't, th you all have to report your number somewhere. So if, as you, you've done that and your next class is on Monday, thank you all for um, joining me today. I've enjoyed the opportunity to, to talk with you. If any of you have any questions, don't hesitate to give me a call. And um, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.